So I'm very excited, particularly in light of our previous conversations and the things that Allison just noted, to introduce our next panel and our next moderator, who to no one's surprise is also Sam McGuire. Our next panel will be for an hour on grassroots activism. Get out and do the things. That's Sam's catchphrase because she's very excited about effective action, which a lot of us organizer types, it, it makes us, it gets us hot. <laughs> effective action is sexy. And as Allison said, the work of local activists and groups is critical to our success. So Sam McGuire, who has been part of this conference already, uh, hasn't received, I think, an official introduction. So I'll give some more background information about her before turning things over so you know more about her. She has a varied background in counseling, education, event planning, and volunteer management. She first got involved in secular organizing and activism following the 2012 Reason Rally and was a founding member of the Southern Maryland chapter of the Washington Area Secular Humanists and later president of the regional organization. She's volunteered for the American Humanist Association, Camp Quest Chesapeake, and the Secular Coalition for America. For the 2016 Reason Rally, she was the volunteer coordinator for over 200 volunteers and helped coordinate on-site logistics for the event as well. In fact, she really made, she pulled things together in an amazing way there. She also volunteered, there's a long history here, as a regional director for American Atheists, which meant that she oversaw the local activism in the Washington DC, Virginia, and Maryland areas. And for that, she earned the Atheist Activist of the Year Award in 2019. A few months after that, we hired her. <laughs> so as American Atheist National Field Director, she now gets to work with more volunteers, local grassroots activists, affiliates, and others to help them in engage on different emerging local civil rights issues, to advocate for state level legislation, and to build thriving communities. And as you see, she has the perfect experience and background for that. So we're glad to have her. I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Thanks, Debbie. So I am going to be uh, introducing our panel of speakers. And uh, before I do, I just want to say a few words about what Debbie said and, and sort of tying into what Allison had to say. I am very, very, very excited to be here. Um, as you might have seen in the chat, I've had a long term relationship with a bunch of our volunteers, and I just am so excited every single day to be able to work with this great group of people and also to recruit new people. So again, plugging that we are always looking for new volunteers and new states uh, who are involved in starting up community groups in their area and getting out there and getting this shit done. So as Larry mentioned in the chat, my, my motto has for a long time has been fuck the bullshit and do the things. And so doesn't matter what that thing is, it can be anything at all. It can be out cleaning a road, it can be doing community service, it can be just simply hosting uh, drinking skeptically at a bar, because as Allison was mentioning from the survey data, it is just so very important to build community where you are and however it is possible for you to be building that community, just for raising the visibility of our community and everybody else, um, making sure that they know we're out there. I also tell people when you're out there doing things and it's particularly good things, make sure that you're out there, you know, wearing that atheist or humanist flag so that folks know that you are uh, part of our community and sort of get rid of their stigmas and, and ideas of, of what um, an atheist looks like and acts like. So with that, I'm gonna start introducing the panel. I'm gonna bring Jen Scott up first. Are, Jen uh, is a community, community organizer. Sort of get rid of their stigmas and, mm -hmm. and ideas of Jen needs what to herself. Um, an atheist looks like and acts like. So with that, I'm going to start introducing the panel. I'm going to bring Jen Scott up first. Jen, you need to close the main hop-in stage platform because there's a 10-second delay. No worries, though. Jen is a community organizer and gra grassroots activist who's planned several protests and include the ARC Encounter, protests, actions countering the KKK and Westboro Baptist Church, and is an organizer for the March for Science for Cincinnati and Cincinnati Pride. She received the 2018 American Atheist Activist of the Year Award at the National Convention in Oklahoma City for her work as Kentucky State Director. 
In 2019, Jen co-founded the Community of Reason, Atheists and Humanists of Oklahoma and Kentucky based in Cincinnati. CORE envisions a secular society that values science, reason, integrity, compassion, and true equality for everybody. She was elected to the American Atheist Board of Directors in 2018 in the role of treasurer. Since joining the board, she's worked for the Ameri with the American Atheist staff on efforts to improve tracking expensive and all those other things that treasurers do for nonprofit organizations, which is something we can maybe talk on later. Next, I'm gonna bring up Tracy Benefield. Tracy works as a Girl Scout experience specialist for the Girl Scouts of Texas, Oklahoma Plains. She's also the Texas State Director for American Atheists and the Executive Director for Atheist Community of Lubbock. Atheist Community of Lubbock was our 2020 Affiliate of the Year for all of the good work that they do. And Jen can tell you later, but I think that CORE was maybe the 2017 or 18 Affiliate of the Year. So we have a lot of folks here on this panel who have a lot of experience building good communities. Tracy is passionate about building strong community, advocating for equal rights. Her work with the Atheist Community of Lubbock, she's built strong, vibrant, and engaged community of non-believers in the heart of the Bible Belt. And I think she can also speak specifically to building coalitions within uh, smaller cities. And then our last panelist is Sarah Ray. And if all of you were joining us last night, you will have seen Sarah uh, accepting the award for Affiliate of the Year this year for the Atheist Community of uh, Polk County, and um, hopefully you joined us for that. And I've lost your bio, Sarah. It's gone away. Too many tabs. <laughs> Do you want me to wing it? <laughs> no, I got it. Okay. Sarah is a transgender this woman who left Christianity with a passion for community building, especially in rural areas where it's often difficult to be out or find like-minded people. She's focused on organizing secular community to focus our energy into productive, positive impacts in our world. Sarah is an endorsed humanist celebrant and so serves on the board of the Humanist Society. She's also a support group leader with Recovering from Religion, co-founder and director of the Atheist Community of Polk County, and producer host of the YouTube show Free Thought in Florida. So thank you everybody for joining us. I'm so excited for you all to be here. I know that we shared some questions and I'm gonna go and just sort of start round robining them, but I really want this to be conversational where you sort of talk to each other as well as just answering questions from me and from the audience, because you all do have such a wealth of knowledge on how to start a group from the ground up and uh, really make it very successful. So the first question that I wanna ask, and I'll start with Tracy and then move to Sarah is, why did you start a group? What possessed you in Lubbock, Texas and Polk County to be like, you know what I should do is start an atheist group? <laughs> um, so for us, we started as a meetup group um, with just a few friends who would you know, gather around and complain about local Christians. And, um, <laughs> uh, but what we found was that we had we had a real need for community. There was a lot of people who had been harmed by evangelical churches. Um, for those of you who don't know, Lubbock is the second most evangelical city in Texas. And um, so there's a lot of uh, religious discrimination here. A lot of people have been harmed by the church, harmed by their parents who were part of the church. Um, and what there's one particular person story that really got me. Um, and she had lost her son to cancer and he was maybe seven or eight years old. And um, she was expressing some real um, hurt uh, from the support she had joined because the other parents were all Christian and they were all saying things like, your son's in heaven now or he's in a better place. And they were very hurtful to her. Um, and so it was things like that where we decided we need to start educating people in the community about how to actually speak to us and how to be respectful. And we need to start advocating for um, our equal rights the same way that a lot of other groups do. And we need to start um, becoming more of a support system for each other because um, the the uh, 
emotional well-being of our group and our friends was really important to us. And so we wanted to start extending that to people who were maybe trapped in these situations and didn't know that there were other atheists in the area that they could turn to. So the need for community was really strong. That's interesting. I, we sort of found the need for community after creating the group. So the genesis of the atheist community of Polk County is is really a selfish one. Um, we had been going to uh, the like monthly uh, speaker series in Orlando with the Central Florida Free Thought community. Um, and so Polk County is between Orlando and Tampa. We're like right in the middle. We're the fourth or fifth largest uh, county in the state, depending on whether you count the water area or not. Um, so it's a very large area right out in the middle of, you know, in, in between these two blue blobs of, uh, of Orlando and Tampa. And so it's an hour drive for us, either direction we go. Um, and that's fine for like once in a while, we're going to go see a speaker. But to be able to do all of the other things that that we wanted to do as a group, um, you know, the the meetups and the cleanups and uh, it, go get engaged in in, you know, local political activism and all of that stuff um, that just didn't work driving an hour either way to to get to a group. So uh, eventually my wife just said, when are you going to stop complaining about it? and start the group and so that's how that's how it all got started and then uh from that that's when we started you know it started as a facebook group because i'm a zennial and uh and as people you know started coming in and finding that um we learned that you know all of the things that we hear about so often from from people in rural areas, you know, oh, I thought I was the only one. I can't believe there's a group. <laughs> there's a whole group of us. Um, this is something that I've been needing for a long time. You know, maybe it was I left my religious community and, and haven't had a community like that since. Um, so we sort of found the need for it out of creating it, um, which is sort of an interesting direction for it to go. So we're having a little bit of a technical problem with Jen, but we will uh, let her restart and come back and answer that question. But I think that what I want to underline there from, from what you said is that there's not one right way to start a group, right? We, we get asked this a lot as organizers, I think, like, what's, what's the best way to start a group or how do you start a group? Or, and there's, there's just not a right answer. And the answer is just to start your group however it starts. Um, and so to that, I wanted to ask, what did you try and fail? What did you try when you were starting? And not to dwell on the failure of it, but you know, we, we have these ideas and we're like, oh, you know what? People will love this idea because it worked in Lubbock. And then you try it in Polk <laughs> County and yeah. it doesn't. And so I, I feel like it's important to share that sort of experience with our folks too. Uh, we, tr we tried a bunch of different um, social things getting together. And it's funny because the, the group that we started with was a group that loved talking about like a bunch of intellectual stuff, right? And um, we had like some, uh, we have a local university here, so we have professors and stuff who would come in and talk. So we thought um, a lot of like discussion nights talking about really intellectual things would bring people out and it just didn't. Uh, we we got the, just the same meetup groups worth of people that would come out uh, you know, to come out to these little discussion nights. It wasn't until we start started doing more social things that were fun and didn't have anything to do with atheism. And that's when we started pe seeing people come out. And I think that's when we started to realize that the need there was was for friends and for family and for, you know, community connection. People had been shunned from their family groups and they needed a second family. And so talking about things that were really intellectual wasn't really the need that we needed to meet. We needed to meet a completely different need for people. We started our group um, sort of when ACEs really took off in uh, in the American Atheist Organization. Um, so we 
we did a lot of that too. We we sort of you know sat down and and broke like broke that out. Okay, what does activism look like? What are some things that we can do that are activisty? Okay, what are the social things that we want to do? What's the community service things that we want to do? Um, what sort of educational opportunities can we make? And we really tried to like uh, find things to fit into these categories because we know that that by you know meeting as many of those as possible, that's where groups tend to find success. Uh, and or that the most successful groups tend to employ those um, those measures. Uh, so we did a little bit of everything. And uh, and like my advice would be if you're thinking about starting a group and you're, you're doing you're going through this process, like try it all and go with what sticks like it, it really is just some trial and error. Um, we thought for sure it was going to be a social thing. And we had, you know, we had some um, uh, wings night meetups and that sort of thing. We tried to do some like breakfasts, uh, coffee chat sort of things. And nobody came. It just no, it, that just did not take off for us. Then we started doing all of this community service stuff, like a actually volunteering, helping people solving problems in our community um around food insecurity is is the big one uh that we we found ourselves in uh and and people have come out of the woodwork to support that and love being a part of that and love helping people um so for us that was that was the thing that at least at this moment in time that's caught on you know and then as you got to keep an eye on that because as your group changes as the as people come and go and they will um, that dynamic will shift a little bit and you need to kind of keep your ear to the ground on, you know, are, are we meeting the needs of the people in the group? So that's, you know, separate and apart from what I do with the atheist community of Polk County, but I identified just from talking to people there, you know, we probably could do with a, a chapter of recovering from religion support group in our area. It's not a thing that's offered. And uh, the, do the therapists understand religious trauma syndrome? And is, is that a thing that's even thought about around here? Um, but at the very least, we could offer peer support. Um, and that was just sort of born out of talking to people and, and hearing their stories and what they their journeys and what they've gone through. So really, it is for me, I would say it's just a lot of trial and error and, and you know, be willing to do be willing to do the things whether they come or not. Uh, I did a cleanup this morning and it was me and my 11 year old son because nobody else came. And that's fine because we still cleaned up two bags full of trash off the roadway and are making a little bit of a difference each time. Uh, and you know, then that goes out to your social media, into your groups, into your circles. And eventually more people see that and, and, uh, they start getting engaged. Would you like to join us? I can. <laughs> <laughs> Look, a whole extra panelist. <laughs> so, for those of you who don't know, this is Becca. Hi, I had to make an entrance. Uh, I'm just okay. kidding. No, I was actually on the road. <laughs> She's actually one of our assistant directors uh, in Polk County as well, and one of the co founders, of course, of Polk County Atheists. So, I, I do want to touch on ACEs because you brought it up in passing. And I know that it is something that most of our activists have heard of or know of in um, in passing, at least. But I want to dive into it just a little bit more. So you mentioned ACEs, and that acronym stands for Activism or Advocacy is the A. Community is the C. E is the Education. And S is the Service. Um, I know that both... Lubbock and Polk County just super excel at the S's, right? You guys both do a lot of service projects and serve your community really well. Um, so I guess what I would love to hear from both of you, as I mentioned at the top, <clears throat> is building those coalitions because it's in both of your cases, it's not just you. It's not just your atheist group or, or humanist group. It's you working with other organizations within your town and city. Um, so how how did you do that? Do you get pushback when you come in? You're like, ooh, we're the atheist community. Uh, <laughs> how does how does that work for you? And meanwhile, we're still trying to work out Jen's. I promise she's here. We'll we'll get her eventually. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. 
Uh, well, for us, we so we in building those those partnerships, we take the approach that we want to um, offer what we can first and invest into other communities and invest into our partners before we start asking anything for of them for us. Um, because if you, uh, you know, start out your interaction with them um, and you're just immediately starting to ask for things, you might not get quite as much back as if you were to, um, as if you were to offer something up first. Um, and plus, you know, it, uh, it shows that you're willing to to invest into the community that you're that you really care about the community that you're a part of, not just about the atheist community, but the community that you live in. You 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 know we don't exist. Our groups don't exist just by themselves. They exist within a larger community. And investing in that community and investing in the issues um, that are important to that community, I, I think, is really important to growing. Um, you know who your partners are. Um, so. That's that's the first approach that we took. And then as far as ACEs, we really ad adopted that and we kind of built our entire organization around it because um, like Sarah was saying, you know, you have to uh, you have to try a little bit of everything and you have to serve a lot of different people, a lot of different needs, and you have to grow and evolve as a group as you start growing. So um, the ACEs um, structure allows you to really address multiple different needs and um, and be able to wrangle in a bunch of different kinds of people that have different needs and need something different from your I think one of the interesting things that I've learned since we started this, so the ACES presentation that, that we sort of received and then that I presented at our, our first, uh, we were doing monthly educational meetings as well, bringing in speakers and, and talking about things. Um, and so we sort of presented this of like, this is what this community is going to be. Um, and there is one slide that's uh, that talks about like how you can find an event that touches on sort of all of those things, right? And I think the example was something like it might have been it was probably comprehensive sex ed, um, where it was talking about like you know volunteer with Planned Parenthood uh, that gets you connected with them. Uh, and then maybe you have a mixer and invite them to one of your things and uh, get involved that way. And then, you know, uh, maybe you go speak at your school board meeting about the need for comprehensive sex education. But it all just sort of it was here's an here's an event that you can put into each of those, make it kind of fit into the aces. And what I've learned, uh, I think, since then is um, it's really a Venn diagram of things. Right. So if I think about what we do when we table at Pride, right, that's an activism thing, but it's also a community thing mm -hmm. uh, because it gets our volunteers out working the booth and gives us an opportunity to, you know, just hang out and be social together. Um, we're educating people. So, like, it, it really is a, a Venn diagram of, of, of things that you're that your work sort of fits into all of those things. Um, so I, I, I tend to look at it differently now. Um, we obviously, we, a lot of things changed with COVID, you know, so we had to scale back all of our in-person stuff like everybody else. So we're not doing those monthly meetings. Interestingly enough, we tried to move them online and everyone is zoomed the hell out. And our online events were just not, wow. nobody was interested because mm -hmm. we're all on Zoom meetings all day long. Yeah. Uh, so that was an interesting thing even, about it. Even the like fun stuff, like the yeah, trying to do game games night. and stuff, it just yeah. didn't get much traction. I don't know. Yeah. I don't even know if that answered the question, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> it did. It did. The question was, how do you engage with other community groups in mm -hmm. your town when you're trying to do things like community service or plan a protest or do whatever. And we're going to try and see if Jen, Jen has found and Mike now after she has left us and joined us like three times now. You guys can't see that on the front stage, but Jen's been struggling. So hopefully she can unmute and speak. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yay. <laughs> First rule of grassroots activism is showing up. That's 80%. So I'm here. You just did. Perseverance. Perseverance. Second rule is very perseverance. Important. Yep. Yep. <laughs> 
So Jen, let's uh, throw a question to you about uh, ACEs. And uh, the question that you missed before that was a time that something didn't work very well when you were starting up your group and maybe lessons learned from that. Uh, well, let's see. Um, Technology is always fun. Um, we were in a unique position when we started the Community of Reason um, in 2019. Um, many of us had already been connected through other secular and progressive groups in the area. And a group of 10 of us or so formed the community of reason because our shared values and goals for what we thought a thriving atheist and humanist group would look like uh, were no longer being met by the existing groups in the area. We wanted to do things a little differently and a way, um, in a way that created an organization and a culture that would stand the test of time beyond our time as activists. Um, and so we, we kind of had a running start, so to speak, and we, um, we approached it by having really in-depth conversations about things that folks liked about the atheist community, things that were missing and what they really needed both as atheists and just as people in general um, and, and adapted our the way we were approaching the work in that way. Um, we all had discussions about our shared values and um, what we wanted to accomplish as a group. Um, what was traditionally in atheist spaces, what we were starting to get into at the time with um, LGBTQ issues and reproductive rights, as well as our other interests and in climate change, which Allison mentioned on the last panel, um, and other, other things that we share uh, as people and interests. Um, let me think. Um, <sighs> Some of the things that we, we've learned over the years um, is um, how to communicate in a group. Um, mo most groups start with a small number of two or three dedicated individuals, and it's very easy to coordinate um, when you've got two or three. But when you're starting with a group of 10, that then quickly expands to 15. Um, again, we're privileged to be in an area that um, already had some established groups, and we, we are really close to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. So we've got a lot of passion in the area as well. Um, when you get to that large group, um, sometimes controlling group communications can be a little challenging, especially over the internet, um, and learning how to facilitate those conversations um, when we really needed to discuss something was one of the challenges. So we developed a, a communications policy to help streamline some of that and to identify times when we needed to stop having the group chat in Facebook and either switch to a different technology or say, wait, we need to get on a video call or meet in person back when we could do that um, and discuss this issue through. I, I want to do a go back, Sam. Is that OK? Yeah, go ahead. You had, you had mentioned, and I completely lost the point, but I'd love to hear from everybody um, about uh, engaging with other organizations and how that interface looks. Um, so uh, obviously, we started our food pantry program with the Unitarian Universalist and Red Tent Initiative, which is a uh, domestic violence uh, response uh, group. Um, Rose Dynasty Foundation is an LGBTQ youth program. And there were several several others. Par Planned Parenthood of Southwest and Central Florida uh, loaned us one of their, <laughs> one of their organizers uh, to help out. Um, and so we we like to call us like we're the island of misfit toys like these are all the groups that the rest of society looks at and goes mm, these people right so uh so it, that's nice that we sort of found you know kindred spirits there um and, and i would say like there's there's the cautionary tale of being like oh religious people are the enemy somehow they're not uh you know when you get into uu there's a lot of woo sometimes and spirituality. And I know that puts a lot of people off. However, they are great allies in doing things that need to get fucking done. Right. If we're going to go out and do the things we could never have done this food pantry thing on our own. We it's impossible to have done it by ourselves. It had to be this coalition of organizations to come together and we each sort of play our own part uh, to make that all work. On the flip side of that, then, uh, there have been instances where, you know, I'll go to Lake Wales and do an invocation and, you know, the torches and pitchforks come out and the whole, the whole town is ready to, to uh, kill the witch. Um, you know, so I, that's a thing that, that I struggle very hard with because uh, we set in motion for our group to be 
you know, something positive. We don't want to be known as the those at like, and I said this last night and it got, I saw it got some comments. We don't want to be jerks. Don't go out there and just be assholes. Like that solves nothing. Go be good people. Be if if we're going to go out and just step into the hole that religion has carved for us mm -hmm. and said, oh, these atheists are horrible, baby eating monster heathens that don't have any morality. Don't go act like it. Like, let's go be good people. Um, and so sometimes, you know, you step into situations where uh, you're not always shown in the best light and that, you know, you kind of lose control of that. But uh that's the thing that we we strive for anyway. So I want to I want to hear from everybody else. Like, what organizations do you guys work with, and how how have those interactions gone? I want to learn. Oh, Sam, you're, you're muted. muted. Oh well. You're still muted, ahead, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> we got this, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day y'all <laughs> so what i started to say is that um i want to jump in actually and answer that from the point of view of my very small group when i first started it um just quickly because i had sort of a backward experience then i think and so again in that that frame of making it so that everybody's story is a little bit different there's not a right way to do it there was no group here there i guess there was like a facebook group but they were I don't know. They were strange. They wanted to hide in like the back closet of a hotel lobby oh. and just have beers. And that was it. And I, that's not really what I wanted to do. And I came to Southern Maryland and, and it's um, a very conservative area compared to Amherst, Massachusetts, where I grew up. And so I just was looking for like-minded folks who wanted to get out and do things. And so we started out as a social group, like most groups do. But we got involved in a local um, dust up over a sex ed class in a library that the library was sponsoring and was canceled underneath uh, a bunch of pressure from the Christian folks. But the, the main pushback was that the instructor was um, a gender nonconforming, she presenting as femme and she had a female partner and she uh, was also um, She'd been the, the keynote speaker at a slut walk, which if anybody's familiar with anything, they know that that's anti-domestic violence uh, protest in DC that happens a lot. So it's not anything bad, right? And so they there was a lot of pushback and the library canceled it. And we ended up holding that class in the library room because there was no LGBTQ group in the area to hold that or to have the ability to rent the room and do all of that. And from that, we actually spawned two more, we, we spawned a P flag and a pride event out of our humanist group. And we were so happy to be able to be like, cool, now go do your things and we'll support you in what you're doing. And so that's sort of a little bit of a different experience than what I hear from a lot of organizers where they're like, well, we were involved in this group, the science group, the March of Science group, and then we decided we wanted to have a humanist group. So I just wanted to share that. Um, and then Tracy, I will now mute myself for real this time and uh, let you take it away. <laughs> well, you know, I was going to say, uh, I actually got some really good advice um, on, you know, our, on how to partner with people from um, a, a member of ours who she had been really involved with the LGBTQ community um, and with the local university. And she had a hard time like, starting up our uh, pride parade or a pride festival that we had, um, but she was involved in the uh, kind of genesis of all of that. And um, she's just this cute little pixie girl. And she told me, you know, use your privilege as a white lady <laughs> to go in and just be as cute as possible when you're talking to people because it disarms them. And, um, you know, and then you can you can get people to do things for you just by being like super sweet and nice. Um, and uh and it worked so that's what we did so because you know here in lubbock you, you you have to use what you, what you're given and i you know i know how to fake or i know how to pass for just your average typical <laughs> christian white lady um and so i used that the same demeanor to just uh say hi i'm from the atheist community and with a big smile on my face and people 
They don't know how to feel about that. The words you're saying are not things that they want to hear, but you just look so happy. And there's, you know, how are they going to argue with that? Um, and so, you know, we just really started uh, asserting ourselves. I would put myself into situations um, and in, into groups that were open to the public and uh, open to other 501s. Working for the Girl Scouts, I knew about some of these little areas. I knew about like the volunteer centers of Lubbock and I knew to go in there as a nonprofit and that's where you make connections. Um, and so I, I went in and one of the early experiences I had was being at the Volunteer Centers of Lubbock um, at a networking brown bag lunch with all these other organizations. Um, and we we're each going around and saying which organization we're from. And whenever I say, I'm with the Atheist Community of Lubbock and this is what we do, um, the eyeballs in the room got real wide and <laughs> everybody was taken aback. But then afterwards, out of the 12 people that were in the room, six of them came up and whispered to me, I'm an atheist too. And, and it was funny because none of them knew that the others were atheists, but half of the people in that room were atheist or agnostic and nobody knew. And so that was one of the things where I realized we were going to get a lot more support if we just put ourselves out in the open and we just put ourselves in the spaces that other nonprofits were in and we networked with each other and we just acted like we deserve to be here we, we will be here and you will learn to deal with it <laughs> and uh, there's going to be a lot more support behind the scenes than um you know than you would think uh, because there's a lot of atheists who are just hiding and um who are hiding who they are because they, they're afraid of coming out but if you take that first step and if you um assert yourself it, it'll make it a lot easier for people to come in behind you and, and do the same thing Jen, did you want to add anything there? No. Yeah, I'll just echo all that. Um, show up and be present. Um, when we first started being active in the area, it, you know, we ran into the same issues. But over time, the more we showed up, the more we participated, people would start walking up to you. Thank you for being an out atheist. I feel more comfortable being having that conversation. Um, showing up for potential partners and helping them with their events. And then at the end of the end of it, you know, they'll come up to you, how, tell me a little bit more about your group. And then you tell them, oh, we're an atheist humanist group. And then some of them are going, cool. Others will have that, that moment of cognitive dissonance, like, wait, this doesn't this does match up with my stereotype. Um, but then they usually quickly get over it and they're like, okay, can, when can, can you come back and help us? Um, and that's great. And then you just, just build it, build the relationship one interaction at the time. Um, we had a, some success with interfaith work um, through pride events, um, connecting with affirming churches and other places of worship. Um, we were invited to a multi-faith. Um, they decided to take the interfaith pride event and make it a multi-faith and specifically reached out to us as an atheist organization. Like we want, we want this, to, this event to appeal to everyone. Can you come and talk from an atheist humanist perspective? Absolutely. Um, and those events um, literally changed hearts and minds in, in our event because we we went there, we talked about our values, we talked about our shared morality, our shared view. Um, and it you know gave a different perspective to what it means to be an atheist humanist to all these people of faith. Um, so, yep, show up, do the things, um, change will happen. So I, there's a couple questions in the chat that are all related, but it's also something I want to touch on because looking at this panel, um, we're all relatively youngish in the movement. And, oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but oh, we are. in the movement. Oh, yeah, well. yeah, in the movement. Thought and so people down. are always asking. We get a lot of comments <laughs> that um, you know that humanist groups are kind of older uh, and also fairly white and also fairly not diverse. And I know that for each of your groups, that's probably not actually true. And people are wondering how to get more diversity into their group, how to get younger people into the group, uh, how do you attract those folks? And I'm sure you have some ideas there. Sarah's method is to just keep throwing things until something sticks. You just have to keep trying. See, isn't that exactly what I said earlier? I wasn't even here. Wow, really? <laughs> uh, we do have an, I, I mean, we yeah. to, to a point, we do have some issue with that. Um, right before COVID, we were having meetings in person. Um, 
we were starting to see a diversity of like ethnic background and people from different religious backgrounds. Um, the the age diversity thing, uh, we are 40 plus and largely like our group yeah. is 40 is 40 plus a couple of young ish 35 young, plus maybe younger but like couples, but not a lot um one of the things that has been on my list um and we're just not enough people to make all these things happen um but w one of the things that as a participant in an atheist organization that i i, I identified as something that we want we definitely need to have this as a part of our group <laughs> at some point is, is something for the kids, right? So we would have our monthly speaker series at the library and there's like a, a hallway closet thing where all the chairs are stored. And our kids would go sit in there with their iPads and just, you know, fuck off for an hour while we had our meeting. And that's not what I want it to be. Like, I let's have science activities for the kids to do. Like, let's go outside and learn about nature and stuff. Like there's tons of things that we could be doing that's, you know, Sunday school for atheist club, but you know what I mean? And so like, oh gosh, how do you get that started? And then, you know, then, then my, my brain spins into the concerns of like, okay, well now we're, you know, we're getting children in groups and what do we need to think of like from a legal perspective, as far as making sure that our volunteers are properly vetted and that all of those T's mm -hmm. and I's are taken care of. Um, but yeah, I think, I think we definitely need to have uh, stuff to engage the kids mm -hmm. in, um, whether that's a standalone thing or, or, you know, a sidecar to the adults are going to go do a thing. The, the biggest thing I think you have to, with any group is identifying the reasons that people don't come. And that's really the only way you're going to know how to make people show up. Um, and for us, and if it's childcare, if they don't right. have childcare, we need to have childcare. We need to have something for the kids to do. For us, that was one of our things: was where our kids go, where we go, yep. and so we wanted it to make it an open, like they're welcome. And it was it it was hard where we were at, and it, it we got lucky. We didn't have a lot of kids in our group, but that that's one of those things post COVID that we're going to have to really scrutinize. Yep. Tracy? Yeah, for, for us, well, I have kids too. And so they do just go wherever I go. I'm a single mom and I, that's, that's just kind of how it is. Um, luckily, I, am, uh, I have a kid who is, uh, for lack of a better term, blessed with the gift of gab. And he will make conversation with anybody. Um, we went to an interfaith dinner once um, and so there's obviously going to be a bunch of kids there with um, parents who are from all different kinds of religions. And Tom stands up on the table and he goes, OK, everybody put your hand up if you don't believe in God. <laughs> and, you know, he's six years old and he's, I, I love he's stirring that. stuff <laughs> up. Um, and, you know, take, giving them something to do, like give them a task whenever you're creating an event, have mm -hmm. a, you know, a youth ambassador and just make it like who, whatever kid is just tagging along, have them give their input and, you know, um, use the, the, the resources that you have. If you have people who have kids, ask mm -hmm. their input, you know, don't think that kids have to be an afterthought or, you know, it's just you're, you're targeting the parents. Um, you know, you can do things for the kids too, and you can engage the kids. Um, coming from a Girl Scout background, you know, I like to make kids look the leaders. I love to do that. I love to have kids um, engaged in what we're doing and and make helping us make decisions. Um, and that's just going to have, it's going to make them have a bond with us and, and feel like we're a real part of, uh, they're a part of our community. As they grow up, they're going to be want, wanting to get more involved and we're going to breed new volunteers by engaging them at, when they're little. Um, and as far as like getting more diversity for, uh, you know, more ethnic diversity, you have to really look at those communities where you live. Like here we have the, you know, the east side of town is mostly African Americans, north side of town is mostly Hispanic. Um, and we took a look at what the issues were in our city that were facing those communities. And then we started to help address those. So, you know, things like 
um, black owned businesses on the east side of town are, are being bought up by real estate companies. So investing in like uh, East Lubbock Art House and all, all these different places that are black owned, that became very important to us. Showing up to protest um, things that matter to those communities um, and investing your time and your energy into helping uh, them with their issues and their needs will show that you're, you know, you really are concerned. You're not just doing it for the optics or you're not just doing it to recruit people. You, the only time you see them is if the only time that you see those people is when you're asking them to join your group, you're doing a disservice. So you want to really be out there and proactive in, in getting out there and meeting their needs first before you need anything from them, before you start asking for something. Um, and I really can't stress that enough. And that, that goes for any group that you're trying to, to recruit before you ever start asking them to join your group. Go and meet their needs first for a few months, for a year and then you start your recruitment. Um, it shouldn't hurt for that because the, you, know, you, you aren't active if you're not present, if you're not there, why would they join you? You're not meeting their needs. So really take the time to listen and take the time to invest in those communities and, and in those mm. people's needs first. Jen, anything to add there? Tracy summed that up beautifully. I don't, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> all done, all done. Uh, so the chat is rolling with a bunch of people talking about families. And I wanted to point out, because apparently we're really good at programming, that our next panel is going to be talking all about non-religious families. So I'm going to redirect us back to actual group sort of logistics. Um, I know that we have a ton of affiliate groups that are, they, they call themselves just meetups. And I would argue that they're not just meetups because they're uh, serving a very important purpose in their community. But the three of you and your organizations have all chosen to incorporate and become 501c3s. And I would just like to touch on how easy or hard that process was and what you see as uh, benefits or drawbacks, if there are drawbacks for organizing in that way with a, with a secular group. And let's go to you, Jen, since you didn't have comments on the last one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so we chose to be a 501c3. Um, for us, it was a pretty um, cut and dry decision, but um, the reasons to become a 501c3 is you increase your credibility. Um, there is a tax exemption if for folks that donate to you, although that's changed recently with the tax changes, but um, as a 501c3, you're eligible for um, grants from funders. Um, you're also eligible for a lot of community reward programs, um, such as Amazon Smile, or if you have Kroger, there's a community awards program that they have available for 501c3s. Mm -hmm. um, you're also eligible for corporate giving. A lot of larger corporations will do um, donation matches or have special programs. Uh, one of our board members uh, worked for a company that um, would pay her what would pay us fifty dollars for every hour she worked as a volunteer for our organization if she was on the board. Um, so you're eligible for those types of programs. Um, the 501c gives you some formal structure to go by, which um, ensures like the long-term stability of the organization. You're putting a lot of passion and work into what you're doing. And most of us want it, that work to continue even when we quote unquote retire from being activists. Um, and that, that structure gives you some of that. Um, it also, you know, for legal purposes, creates a separate legal identity from your organization. So you get some liability protection from that. It separates you from individuals. Um, you can set up a bank account under the organization's name, which that's gotten stricter over the years. You no longer can be just a group that wants to have a bank account. There's a lot more regulations um, with some of the changes that have occurred recently. Um, one of the drawbacks is, is doing the paperwork. Um, I, it's it's a process. It's not horrendous. If you file your taxes, you can handle filing paperwork. Um, American Atheist has an amazing template for bylaws um, that you could start with and just modify. Um, we can also walk you through the process, um, and we're happy to. At any, you know, Sam and I have talked about scheduling another webinar where we walk through the details of creating a 501c3, so we can walk you through all that. Um, one of the drawbacks is um, when you become a 501c3 and you have to form a board, um, most states require you to have at least three, um, sometimes four board members. Um, you, you give up some of the control. This, this thing now legally exists outside of you. 
um, and you're you're beholden to the board, um, you become subject to scrutiny, for lack of better words, um, to the members and your donors. Whereas if you're just controlling like your book club, like if I started Jen's book club and I just wanted to read dystopia novels, then this is what we're going to do, like it or get out, right? That's my little club. But once I form a nonprofit organization, it becomes something that's other than me and I lose some of that control, but I gain so many more benefits. Um, so yeah, that's my, my spiel to start with. Happy to answer more questions. about Sarah and Becca? Um, so yeah, the process is is really simple. Um, and I would say like, look beyond the 501c3, right? The, the pieces of the puzzle beyond that are, you have to organize as a corporation in your state, then apply for your 501c3. If you're gonna take, in, in Florida, if you're gonna take donations, then you have to go to the state and apply for a solicitation of contributions. And if you're going to sell things, you have to collect sales tax and that has to be a whole thing. Don't, well, I'm not gonna tell you don't do that. We didn't do that. We're, go to threadless.com and search Atheist Community of Polk County if you wanna buy our stuff, they handle the sales tax. Uh, that's how we do that. <laughs> Merchandise stuff, we don't sell tangibles. So easy. Um, so yeah, the process of it is is easy. And I will say one thing that I love about this community broadly is that we are all like super helpful, like pick up the phone. No, don't call me. Text me, shoot me an email. Like I'm happy to help you as long as you don't call my phone. Um, <laughs> so true. Da David Williamson at the Central Florida Free Thought community and I went back and forth and he was like, here, this is all of my things. Like, here's all of my documents. Here's what my bylaws look like. Here's what our uh, incorporation documents look like. And you're welcome to use them, copy them, take what you like, what you don't. Like, if you have questions about the process, ask me. And so I know like there are tons of groups that are willing to help through that mm -hmm. process. Um, and American Atheists is happy to help walk through that process. Uh, so that's that's getting it going is really easy. I think Jen hit on all of the really sort of the pros and cons. Um, it, it came down to why did we do it? We needed money. Uh, it came down to the fact of like, if we're going to do more than just go to B-dubs once a month or twice a month, <laughs> like if we want to really go do things, yeah. we need money. And if I'm going to ask you to give me money, I want I want you to at least be able to write that off on your taxes. Um, and all of the other benefits and, and such that come with it. Yeah. Uh, finally, I will, I will add one other thing. Um, Amazon Smile is wonderful. If you are also one of those people who absolutely hates uh, the, the corporate machine and don't want to do the Amazon thing, iGive is an alternative um, that you can install in your browser. And anywhere you shop online, there's a phone app too. Um, a, a bunch of different stores and, and vendors are in that program and it does the same thing as Amazon, except that you're shopping at other places too. So check that out also. I think that y'all y'all hit on most uh, everything that I was going to say. I mean, Jen, you really laid out all the pros and cons pretty well. Um, but I'd also say that, you know, some of the other things coming from, because I, my job is in the nonprofit world anyway, because I work for Girl Scouts and we're a nonprofit. There are other benefits than just um, finances that come with becoming into 501. So becoming a charity allowed us into a lot of these spaces that are typically reserved for just nonprofits um, to advertise ourselves. So for instance, um, the Volunteer Centers of Lubbock that I was talking about, it's a networking um, you know, website and, and group that's just for nonprofits in Lubbock. And they can't deny you because you're an atheist group, you know, they're going to let you in anyway. So you can post volunteer opportunities and, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do with them. Um, the local university hosts a, a, a big conference with all the local nonprofits where you get to table for free. Um, there are, you get to enter into the, uh, you know, parades in town and get discounts. And there's all kinds of stuff like that. There are a lot of, a lot of perks where you get to network and be in spaces where other nonprofits are and you get to meet a lot of people. Um, and I think that that for us was a, a big benefit that we didn't anticipate, but that, um, you know, we really uh, take advantage of now. Um, and I would also like to point out that in addition to, to uh, on the logistical side, to all of the paperwork, one of the places I would spend a lot of time in is on your mission and vision statements. 
And, and the reason I say that is because it's not just something like you just do to get it out of the way to get all the paperwork done. That mission and vision statement should guide every decision that your board makes. And so spending a lot of time and getting the wording completely right. And it it's what communicates to the public who you are. And so spending a lot of time there is really beneficial and it's part of that paperwork. But I wouldn't rush through that portion. I would really spend a lot of time and be very thoughtful about the mission and vision statement because it, it will direct from then on um, how your group is run. And to Jen's point, she was saying, you know, you kind of give up a lot of the control when you incorporate as a 501. But if you set uh, the vision and mission statement correctly, if you if you really spend enough time on it, then those same principles and the same ideas that you started the group with will be what continue to guide the group even after you've moved on from it. Um, so if you spend a lot of time making that you know, really solid foundation, um, then you should see your group grow and flourish even after you're you're no longer involved. Thank you for that, because I do think a lot of people don't spend a lot of time thinking about what they want the end product of their group to look like when they start it, right? Um, it might not be an intentional thought that you have of, of what do I want this group to grow to, because at the time you're starting it, you're thinking about, I just want to find some other people who think like me so I don't have to censor my speech around them, um, particularly if you're starting from scratch in a place like Lubbock or Polk County or St. Mary's County. Um, so with that, we're actually at we're at time, guys, and we have some questions. So I'm going to actually take a, you know, a little privilege here of being the person who moderates all the things and ask <laughs> one more question. Um, from each of you just to sort of uh, closing thoughts. And what I'm curious to hear is, is if you could offer one, one piece of advice to somebody who's starting a group tomorrow, uh, what would it be? Look, I made them all quiet. It never happens. It's so great. I, I would say be brave. Uh, that, that's my, my advice. Uh, speak up, be in the spaces. Um, don't be afraid to represent the entire group. <laughs> don't be afraid to speak up and represent all atheists all over the world. <laughs> like you, they're go you're going to, when, when you meet somebody, especially if there's not a, uh, you know, or an organization locally, like like in Lubbock, I'm in the heart of the Bible Belt. It was very terrifying for a lot of people to uh, come out of the closet. Um, be once you're out, just be out. If you're going to be the leader of a group, be the leader and lead. And it, people will be just. You have to set the bar for how brave people are are able to be. And if you're not able to be out completely, you know, it's going to make other people more nervous about being out. So um, you set the bar, you set the example, you be brave and you be the leader if that's, you know, the role that you're stepping into. Jen? Don't be afraid to make mistakes. There are no mistakes. There's just learning opportunities. Um, there's no right way or wrong way to do this. Try it. If it works, great. Keep improving that. If it doesn't go quite as expected, um, you know, change something and, and try again. And you know, as Sarah mentioned earlier, reach out to the community. We're here to help. And yes, most of us will share gladly here. Again, don't call me. I'm a texter too. Um, but yes, we're here to help. Thank you for saving this one for me. My piece of advice is just do the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. Don't be afraid. Don't like you're going to overthink it. You're going to second guess. You're going to oh, are people going to like it this way or how, how should we do this? Jump, Whatever. Jump on just, the bowl white knuckled. <laughs> yeah, just just do it. Just do it. All right. See, that was perfect. So I am going to plug that we do have another panel coming up. We're actually going to take a short break for probably about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll be back here in 10 minutes. Everybody can go grab a drink of water, get a snack, cup of coffee. Uh, probably some of you, it's almost five o'clock everywhere. Uh, might go get a drink. I don't know what you're doing, <laughs> but go and we will be back here in about 10 minutes and we will see you then.
Thank you everybody so much for your insight and sharing your experiences with everybody in our audience. Thank you, Sam. Thanks everybody.